Thank you so much. It's, um, it's important for me to start off by, first of all, acknowledging um, that I'm on country at the moment in a remarkable space that's been nurtured by, um, by Aboriginal people here for thousands and thousands of years. And just in very recent times, Wollongong universities come here and they've really soaked up a lot of that energy and you can, you can feel that in this space. I'm, I'm really lucky to be a graduate of Wollongong University. I did my undergraduate here and this is where I started teaching 24 years ago. Um, <laughs> so 23 years ago, so a long time ago. Uh, in fact, I was reminded by Andrew before that I started uni here. Um, the year you were born, Andrew, was that right? Yeah, that's right. As a mature age student. <laughs> so, um, I, I, yeah, I apologise, I've got my name up there twice, so you won't forget who I am. Um, I'm going to start off by going through a little bit of who Bachelor Institute is and then get into the, into the space. But just even before that, um, as a preface, I've been asked to talk about a new publication that's coming out called Gay and Grey. Uh, sorry, yeah, Gay and Grey, yeah. Um, and it's by Rag and Bone Man Press, and it's We Would Like to Gather Stories of First Love, of Struggle and Defiance, of Resistance and Pride, Stories of Meeting That Special Someone, and it's looking at the G uh, LGBTIQ community uh, in Australia and internationally. Uh, so they're calling for writers. There's about a six-week deadline of it, and I've got some notes here, and uh, I'm to understand since it's been a bone of contention that... Uh, it's early 40s onwards, apparently, is gay and grey. So if you feel like you have the capacity to be a bit grey... I'm grey. I know, and <laughs> you're absolutely ineligible. Uh, so, and I, I should also mention that this project is being put together by one of our first uh, graduates in the PhD program at uh, Bachelor Institute, Dr David Hardy, uh, who is also my brother. <laughs> so there you go, it's all very incestuous. Uh, but again, if you, if, you, if you know people, if you want to um, uh, send it on to someone, please do. could be stories, it could be images, uh, it could be reflections, it could be poetry. And uh, it's a wonderful collection that's coming together, I have to say. I've been uh, hearing about it incessantly. Uh, so, yeah, I highly recommend it. Uh, so I'm... Uh, going to kind of move through this, but I just wanted to say I am funded by the Australian Research Council and by the Office for Learning and Teaching. We've been really lucky at the Institute to have national funding uh, for some of our programs. And uh, this is uh, Bachelor Institute. I know some of you, are, particularly our international visitors, may, might not know Bachelor and they may not know where we're located. So I just wanted to geographically locate us, as well as give you a little bit of a sense of who we are. We've got two and a half thousand students, all of whom are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, uh, and we're a dual sector tertiary education provider, so we have uh, vocational education training, we have higher education, uh, and we have uh, research degrees, so we've got PhDs and master's programs. And we do a lot of career research and we work with a lot of other universities because we're small. Um, I, we have about 28% of our staff are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, I'm the most senior, um, which is, uh, except uh, not now, because I do have to say that we've just gotten a new director who's a Matu man, um, and uh, Bob Somerville, who's just come in to run the institute. Uh, we're very lucky. So they're our core values, integrity, quality, respect, sustainability, leadership and relevance. Um, and we work on a model of both ways um, practice. And if you want to read more about it, you can have a look at our um, website, and it's got quite a bit of information on there. So this is where we're located. We're throughout the Northern Territory. Um, and Bachelor is the name of the township um, that's just an hour south of Darwin. Uh, we've also got campuses in a whole lot of remote and regional locations. Uh, this is actually an older map, I should say. We've increased the number of um, places that we're delivering to, and it's significantly higher than that. One of the reasons that we have research, and I'm going to be really blunt about this, is that we try and offset and support the cost of delivery of VET programs into community through the research that we do. It's, it's my job and it's other people's job who work in the research area to not just generate funds for our research, but to generate funds that matter to the community so that we can continue to do the work that's really needed and that can't be supported in any other way. So, uh, whoop, 
heading in the right direction? Maybe. Okay, so, um, so this is the ridiculously long, probably not completely what I'm covering off on uh, name of the presentation today. I wanted to talk about the response in repose, uh, because I'm clearly not in repose at the moment, uh, is part of a work, um, a sound text work that I've created that is about trying to think about gender and sexuality as a central space, as something that is relaxed, something that does not require energy to think around, but in fact is a centralising ontology. And so, in a way, it's about trying to engage that and trying to move what's considered normal within, within the sort of space of sexuality and the body. Um, and obviously, well, maybe that's not obvious, but hopefully the most uh, significant um, issue around the body for most of us is that that's what normal looks like. Bronwyn's laughing, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's what a normal person looks like. You know, that we are normal, all of us are. But this whole notion of, and, you know, I'm not telling you anything with this, except that it's a good place to start in thinking about what it means to start to calibrate. Um, because calibration is always about something being normal. And so what if normal is an Aboriginal lesbian? What if the rest of you that aren't that aren't, <laughs> you know? And, and what if that's something to aspire to? Good luck. You can't sometimes. You know, some of you may. Uh, so, so again, why does any of this matter? Part of it is about this whole notion of, of really centralising a space where difference is not marginalised. Um, and, you know, to that end, it's one of the problems that I and many people have with the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, that constantly talks about indigeneity as a space of, space of marginalisation, dispossession, disadvantage, and in fact, it limits the numbers as a result of that. Well, you know, applying fundamental intersectionality, the same is true across our ever-decreasing circles, unless they're ever-increasing circles of identity. And so, rather than seeing them as things that close in, I'm interested in the idea that it's something that expands. So I um, have to say, in spite of all of this, I, uh, I am, so there are obviously pictures of me, uh, I'm an academic, I have a PhD in creative arts, and my PhD was actually on gender and sexuality and indigeneity, it was about intersections of that, which is great. It's not mostly what I do in terms of my career research. Most of my career research is on identity but really framed in a very different way. It's around museums and it's only recently and it's thanks to this forum in fact and thanks to discussions that I've had with Bronwyn which you may see as slightly ironic um, that I've started to think about uh, about it again in light of the what I would see as disconnected work and so I'm going to try and recalibrate myself that work into this space of thinking about gender and sexuality and I want to kind of bring you on a journey of it. The good news is that there's an awful lot of slides so you don't have to listen to me just banging on about it. So I would um, presented something uh, in the last six months and I've just um, gone through a process where it'll be published as well but it's actually on my blog site about the way that one dresses, you know, what you're expected to do in the academy. And I think those of us who've been in the academy for some years knows that it's changed. Uh, that I remember when I first started teaching at um, Wollongong, I used to get on the bus in uh, Coromel Street in my pyjamas and, you know, come down here and start teaching and nobody really blinked. Now I go to these, you know, fairly, fairly major forums and the idea that I dress in T-shirts, jeans and, you know, and a, and, a, and a hoodie with, you know, in this very informal way, people see it as challenging or they dismiss me. And I'm not alone. I mean, I'm, I'm, t I'm talking about myself in that space, but in a sense, this is about gender. It's certainly to at least some extent about sexuality, but the conflation of gender and sexuality kind of presents it as, you know, as something that, that works across that space. But it's also about these expectations of what normal is and how that becomes then recalibrated. And so I'm intrigued about that. And it, of course, as you can imagine, makes me push the point, and it's why, in fact, I present in this way. Um, sorry. 
or like that if it's cold, sorry. Got a bit over, over excited about that. Okay, I've actually got just a few slides from my PhD, um, which was uh, more than 10 years ago now, so there's a bit of age to it, but uh, that's me sitting on a toilet. Um, I'm, I'm a sound text artist, so I work in installation often, and so this is a, a print uh, you know, version, but obviously there were limitations to what I could kind of show uh, in this space. Uh, well, when I say limitations, that actually is a picture of my clitoris at the bottom, so they're not those, but just in terms of an audio piece. So, so this is, you know, this is obviously me dressed as male, sitting on the toilet as I do. Um, this is me dressed as a lady, uh, m much less successful, one would, one would, one would say. What's that? Mm, yeah, I think the, maybe the point was that I don't do that very well. So, and, and that's me dressed as me, um, which I also don't do that well. Uh, so <laughs> it's, but it, it, it came out of a sort of discussion where uh, I'd been asked if I'd always been a woman. And, uh, and this is something that comes up. I mean, it comes up from time to time, and you can imagine that some of it is on the phone, uh, because I do sound like a boy. Uh, and or a middle-aged man, in fact. Uh, and that's, uh, it's, it's been an interesting problem, but what actually started to happen to me about 10, maybe 15 years ago, was something that I'm sure a lot of people in this room have experienced, and that's that, and in fact, it was reflected in the discussion, and that's going to the toilet. I've actually been asked to go into the other loo a few times. Uh, particularly when I was dressed in overly feminine ways, <laughs> which is fascinating. Um, and the reaction from people was to be embarrassed for me. Uh, so I had these enormous reactions when I started to talk about this and present it publicly, where people would say, oh, no, you're fine, you actually look really feminine. <laughs> like, like I needed to have that reinforced, like I cared. Um, but also, like there needed to be some sort of adjustment, some apology you know, that I had this sense of loss. And I was really intrigued about what that meant. And I was intrigued about how that worked with what I would say is, especially as I get older, less of a visibility about being Aboriginal, you know, so that I'm often cast as white. And that's a really interesting space. It's fascinating travelling internationally or even around Australia and being able to pass as white and what that means. Uh, you know, and, and in particular because I think it wouldn't uh, surprise anyone who was my age to know that uh, it was something that I'd, uh, and I'm very ashamed of saying this, but it's still true, that I was something I aspired to when I was younger and, and something that was made easier by disconnection from family. And so there's an interesting problem there in then trying to bring these elements together, as I think we do. So... So, uh, so this, I would say, as a PhD, wasn't terribly successful, but it was an interesting process to start to think about what might happen next. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, and my work has largely been in drag performance. Um, for quite a few years, I, was a, I used to be a musician, and so I did a whole lot of musical performance work. And people would feel fairly comfortable about the idea that that was... Uh, the work I was presenting, I seemed to fit the, the model. I was, I was an Elvis impersonator. I can kind of sound like Elvis, so as you do. Um, Brahmin's enjoying this far too much. Um, so, so, look, you know, it's a, it's a remarkable um, journey then to sort of cut that off and go, actually, this is some of the stuff that I want to be thinking about, and all of that work that I've done does inform it. So it doesn't surprise me that it's taken me quite a few years to work out wh why and how. So the work I'm doing at the moment is a project called Reversing the Gaze. Yeah, I know, it's a bit of a daggy old term. But it, I really mean it for what it is. It was that idea of looking at these national museum spaces that are just dreadful at representing and engaging First Peoples, Indigenous Peoples around the world, and then saying to them, um, what do you do well? You know, and how do you... How do you do it? And so they're being interrogated, you know, by somebody who's not only Indigenous, but about the way that they're engaging Indigenous contexts. So it's not going to communities. Communities know how to do this. They don't need to be interrogated. It's the museums that aren't so sure. So they're the ones that are part of this. It's a positive spin. This is a positive story about what museums are doing well. And it's the big museums, because the smaller museums largely work 
a lot better, and I, I don't mean across the board, but there's a lot more innovation that can happen at a smaller museum. It's a lot harder with these large museums. So throughout the time that I did this, I visited um, uh, two, uh, 450 museums, uh, so over four and a half years, which is quite a lot of museums, over three countries. So it was the US, uh, Australia and the UK. I won't go into huge detail because it's actually very involved and those of you who heard me talk about this before know that the UK is a very strange inclusion because I am looking at their first peoples. Uh, there is an argument for it and it came from the elder in the community and so there's a, a fairly well documented discussion about why and how they're included. Uh, but this is the project and this is the, uh, the overview information that's uh, provided. So they get a little sheet. So I go through museums like the National Museum of the American Indian, Washington, um, and you know it's been a remarkable ally in this uh, as well as you know a very challenging space that's trying to represent Western Hemisphere, um, so thousands of communities and it would argue that it doesn't do it very well and uh, my experience in this probably will resonate for many of you is that places that think they don't do it well probably do it better than places that they think they do it perfectly. And so they, they are worried about their capacity to be able to represent all of these spaces. And of course, I'm sure you can see where, that's the, where this is headed in terms of thinking about um, gender and sexuality in particular, and that's that the representations that I was seeing in these national spaces were really attempting to challenge some of the ideas of identity. Um, and they're really trying to challenge what people thought about uh, when they walked into a museum and saw a representation of a community. So they wanted it to be current. They wanted it to be real. So if you go into a part of the National Museum of the American Indian that talks about uh, a particular community, and there's 18 communities that are represented within the space, arguably 24, um, uh, until this last year when they're renewing them, um, they're, they will do things like pr make sure that people have contemporary clothing on, as well as ensuring that there is uh, clothing that is, is significant in ceremony. So it's challenging some of those tropes of identity, but it's also in some ways reinforcing ideas that will support the, you know, the notion that that community has a unique contribution. And Certainly of many of the successful museums, and I mean successful in the sense that they talk about themselves engaging and representing communities well, that's what I was starting to see. I was seeing that they were in these spaces, they were the ones that were really doing these challenges and saying, you think it's this, but actually it's this. And people were walking out of there learning something about the space, not just having a fairly reductive idea of, uh, of the community being reinforced. And what I rarely saw on reflection, um, and I didn't just reflect on this recently, obviously it's something that's popped up from time to time and I've got some examples of it, was that I, it was really rare for there to be anything around sexuality and uh, sexuality I mean, I'm not talking about necessarily GLBTQI, I'm talking about far broader than that. You know, so, uh, so there, there really was very little, and I think it, it goes to everything that you were saying before about sexuality just being something that is beyond the pale, <laughs> if you, you know, uh, pardon and uh, in fact accept the pun. Uh, so I think one of the issues that, we, um, that, that exists is not just in terms of thinking of sexuality and gender, but it's also this notion that intersectionality is just a bridge too far for people that they can think about one thing at a time. The visitor can only contemplate one thing that is an alteration. And of course, it, it's nonsense. It's not true. <laughs> you know, visitors often walk into these spaces and, and the visitor reflections um, tell us this. They walk into these spaces and they don't know anything about a community. So everything becomes new. You know, their knowledge is so small that in fact all of it becomes new information. And so there is the potential for that. There is the potential for a pan-indigenising to occur as well, and that has to be carefully managed. So, so again, this is the NMAI, sorry, I've always got that shot in there because it actually shows you some corn growing in the gardens and then behind that the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Um, this is the Potawatomi Healing Trail in northern Wisconsin in Crandon, um, which is one of the Potawatomi communities uh, uh, 
healing trails that's part of their museum space. And the museum spaces in this context, they have a women's and men's um, trail. And this is the women's trail. And it's, it's been really interesting to see how difficult they found it for their visitors to comply, you know, to ensure that they're actually only going on the same gendered trail. And in some cases, they found it difficult for the interns that they've had to understand the importance of it as well. And so I was really intrigued about, about that because these are some of the challenges that we face. We don't have a, a national museum at the moment. Maybe we never will. Um, but if we did, you know, what, how would we manage this? Um, again, this is the Mashantucket Pequot Museum viewing platforms in uh, Connecticut. And this was an interesting space to look at in terms of the, the issues around, um, around gender and sexuality. By the time I started to talk to the Mashantucket Pequot people uh, who ran the museum, I had realised that the gender sexuality thing was a question that I had. Um, so I have one open question with this project and that's what works. You know, what works in that representation? But I tease it out a bit when we're talking about it and I started to ask that question here. And one of the difficult things in, uh, in, in, in the discussion of what would be possible to talk about uh, to, their, to their visitors was the concerns, two concerns. One, that the community may not feel comfortable about it. And, you know, that's one that they've talked about publicly. So it's something that's, you know, a known. But the other is a really important one. Um, oh, the, that's a really important one, of course. But, but the other is one that I don't know that I've imagined. And that's that as you go through the Mashantucket Pequot uh, Museum, and I'm sorry, I don't have an example of this, but I do have some that you can see uh, if you'd like. I, I didn't really want to be showing bodies in this way. Uh, there is a transformation, it's a chronological space. You know, a lot of museums are chronological. Starts from the beginning, however that is framed by the community, national community, whatever, um, through to contemporary era. So the representation of, uh, of gender within that space um, was pretty much what you'd imagine it was going to be. And I don't think there were any challenges or any, any, anything that really surprised me in that journey, which is probably one of the reasons that I reflected on it, there was nothing about sexuality. And, uh, and I do mean nothing, this is the biggest national, this is the biggest, what's framed as a native space, native space in the, in the US, arguably the biggest in the world. So we're talking about a lot of square feet of, of representation. What they'd said was that um, because as you start to go through, this is a very diorama heavy Museum. There are a lot of dioramas, there's a lot of people, you know, that are being represented. And in the early stages of it, you actually see a whole lot of people who look like the perception of native people. So they look like this is uh, somebody who's seen uh, movies with cowboys and Indians. Um, so it starts to look familiar to me in those early stages. As I go towards the end, something changes. Something changes in the diorama and something changes in the people. And by the end stage, you know exactly what it is because there is, this is a fairly small enrolment at, in Mashantucket Pequot and uh, in, the, in the Pequot tribe. And uh, almost all of them are visibly African-American. And so their concern was that that's the challenge that they have is to remind people and to inscribe normal but different. But normal means not me. <laughs> you know, it means that it was just seen a, as that journey too far. Um, so I think there are some challenges to some of that. So the next thing that I, the next place I found myself was the British Museum. It's okay, we won't spend much time there. Looking at these spaces like the, um, the, the uh, old Roman wall at the Museum of London, all of these spaces that are inscribed as, to some extent as native spaces. Now this is a really interesting piece. This is the London Before London exhibition at Museum of London, which talks about uh, 6,000 years, sorry, I'm just checking that I'm right in the, uh, yeah, 6,000 years, uh, before Common Era, so 8,000 years ago, 
this object is, um, is uh, dug up in recent years, um, comes from that era. And uh, the object is, uh, they think, uh, neutral gendered. They think it was intended to be neutral gendered. Um, and they think that this was standard practice for the people who lived in the Thames Valley at the time. However, none of the material that's provided along with this in the museum suggests that. None of it. They, and again, they were asked why. So this is MOL Archaeology, which is the largest archaeological team in the world. They were asked why, and the answer was it's too much for people to be able to comprehend. So it's too much extra information. And what's happening is we're missing this. You know, this is extra stuff. You know, this is the, the little things, the big things, you know, that may not affect our lives directly, but that give us a context. Um, similarly, I had a really interesting discussion with this is the uh, Museum of Scotland, National Museum of Scotland. And again, it's a chronological space. It starts off in the space of, um, of uh, when Scotland was a separate um, entity and then when it joined and became part of Great Britain, so this is um, in deep time. And then it moves into the space of early peoples and it, uh, and it goes up into the space of being colonised, into the space of becoming colonisers themselves and into the space of um, the freedom movement. Uh, and so it's a very interesting, uh, arguably native space, uh, uh, this is uh, because of the nature of the land in Scotland, because of some choices that were made by the National Museum of Scotland about not displaying bodies. Um, they had made these um, modern representations of bodies. And the modern representations, the artist argues, are not gendered. Um, and one of the interesting things is because the bodies that these objects, which are deep time objects, we're talking about 7,000 years ago objects, were found in, oh sorry, in some cases, and you can see from this one that it's, later, it's a later period, it's only 3,000 years ago. Um, but what, what uh, happened was the bodies had disintegrated and all material had disintegrated, this was what was left behind. And so what they'd done was um, guessed. Uh, so in the earlier presentation of this, they'd guessed at the gender and they think from a whole lot of other information that they got it entirely wrong. Um, and so here they've made the decision to not gender um, the representations that are then wearing, wearing the objects and they're being very careful about how they wear them for that reason. So it's a, so it's a very interesting um, decision, I think, to, to make in that space. So I had the experience, this is um, a guy called um, David who's at the um, National, uh, sorry, National Museum Wales uh, St Fagans uh, Social History Museum. Okay, so it's uh, one of their national museums in Wales uh, and they talk a lot about, obviously, you know, the importance of speaking Welsh language. And I, I talked to David at length. I also talked to, I'm just going to skip forward to the guy next. This is a guy called Robbie. Sorry that they're just completely uh, <laughs> nationally appropriate names. This is Robbie from... Um, uh, the Highland Folk Museum in, uh, the, in Scotland. And uh, he is playing the part here of a schoolmaster, uh, but in his working life he was a, a fairly well-known journalist. Um, and back to uh, David, who is, um, who is also playing that role, in these spaces where they're trying to represent the past and they're trying to talk about what happened within Welsh schools and within... Uh, Scottish schools, Highland schools in particular. And bo in both cases, they're talking about language. So they're talking about Gaelic, which is how they frame Gaelic in uh, Scotland and in the Highlands, and here Welsh. And he's actually wearing a Welsh knot, um, which is an N-O-T, which is what children were forced to wear if they started to speak Welsh in school. Um, so it's a moment, you know, one of those moment activities. And I got to talking to both of them about um, gender and sexuality because... I suspected that I recognised an accent. I thought they were both gay. And so I started talking about it, you know, and, and, they, and in both cases they said, we don't talk about it here because it's not relevant. You know, and again, there was this both sort of available font of information and it was interesting, but they saw it as a distraction. Even, I would say, 
the case of one of them, I won't say which one, dangerous. Um, and fascinatingly, there was, again, in neither of these two spaces, anything that talked about gender beyond very narrowed constructions of gender. And by narrowed, I mean the concept that women did very specific tasks, even though frequently what happens, particularly in these sorts of representative museums, they frequently discover that they were wrong and then recalibrate. So again, there's a process of gender recalibration that occurs within those spaces. Um, so, I, uh, oh, sorry, having said that, I want to be really clear that in both of the cases of those two gentlemen, they were completely out, and obviously I'm saying this in a public forum, and they, and they you know, they expressed uh, both a concern and an interest in the fact that it wasn't being discussed. So it wasn't just, it's not relevant, it was, it's not relevant, is it? You know, and how would it be, and how might that happen? And in the same way as this issue of the representation of First Peoples in the museum, people sometimes have very narrow views and being able to just worry that out and think it through will sometimes be enough to actually get people to, to do that. So um, now I found, find myself at the Creation Museum. Anybody know anything about that? I've done some talk about this before, so some people might... Ooh. So it's in um, Kentucky. And, I mean, you're probably familiar with creationism if you haven't heard of the Creation Museum. So anyway, it's a museum that talks about creationism. So it reinforces the idea that the world was, is about 6,000 years old. Um, is it 6,000 or 6,500? Anyway, not very old. Um, and, you know, I mean, I can make jokes about it, but this is, you know, this is their own ontological space. This is their own story that they're telling about, about this, their world. You know, so this is a, a whole bunch of, um, of, of Christians, and you can reframe it if you like as you know, in the South, in the US, etc. except that let me just tell you that the person who started it comes from Brisbane. Um, and uh, the idea with this is to set up a space where an al alternative story is told. I needed to go there because I was going to all of these spaces that were spaces like the Potawatomi Healing Trail, spaces that were talking about spaces like absolutely Mash and Take at Pequot that talks about deep time, you know, that talks about the construction, you know, when people arrived, you know, and when they, you know, how they came to be in that space that they're in, you know, and different ontologies across these, you know, there's no pan-indigenising here, it's different, different ones across this space. And I started to think as I was doing that, maybe I need to really properly think about um, what happens in an alternative space. And I started to look at a bunch of different, um, different places that were starting to tell this story of maybe there's another story to hear about how we all got here. What was different about the Creation Museum as opposed to, I'll just work through some slides, as opposed to um, the, this is a child dangerously close to a dinosaur uh, there because obviously they live in the same time. Um, <laughs> And uh, the, the, the risk, this is, you know, there's a whole lot of science in here, and I've said before, but I'm not very good with science, and so I do worry that I've had a little bit of osmosis, and this is how I now think that, that stuff was formed. But they've got an answer for everything. There is an answer for things, but it's a response to evolution. And you can see that all of it is a response to evolution. That is not what happens within a native space. It's one of the reasons why gender and sexuality suddenly became this incredibly important moment for me to consider in the construction of the way that Indigenous people, First Peoples, were framing themselves in these spaces, was to say, hang on, you know, people can seamlessly talk about evolution unproblematically alongside the, the, the way that a community believes it was formed and their own truth with that along with the, another perceived truth around evolution that changes all the time too. You know, so that these ideas are completely comfortable next to one another in a whole lot of native community spaces, right in the US or indigenous spaces here, in, other, in spaces that I've seen around the world. So in this space where people are able to do that, why isn't it happening with, why are we, why are we suddenly being reductive when it comes to gender and sexuality? Why are we trying to tell an equal but diminished story? You know, why, 
what's the, what, what does it do for us? And so I became really intrigued about that. And, you know, there were a number of things just to, again, this is a bit of an aside and not just a chance to show off my Creation Museum photos. Um, but there were a whole lot of things in here about gender and sexuality. And I, I suddenly realised that of the 450 museums that I'd gone to, it was maybe one of the only ones that had stuff on gender and sexuality. And, uh, you know, it was pretty definitive. Um, well, what they saw as alternative sexualities are not good and that there are ways that men and women should be. You know, but they, you know, and while obviously, you know, most of us, maybe all of us see that as um, incredibly problematic, it was also talked about. It's discussed, it's there. Um, yes, it's a definitive, you know, this is my argument with why it's problematic, but not more than that. So, um, so that what's happening here is that this boy's gay and his parents are breaking up because of it. It's actually his fault. So, um, and, uh, oh, and guess what this person died of? Yeah. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, probably the most powerful uh, anti-gay message, and this is in vid on video, so, and it's not available on video, so, um, but they've actually got a story of what happens when two uh, housewives get a bit too close. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, of course, this is, yeah, this is, uh, she's not giving birth to a tornado. Uh, these are all of the terrible things that can happen to you. Childbirth, of course, we know that there was no pain before uh, the whole Adam and Eve thing, which kind of does raise the question of surely that was the first birth. So anyway, um, but, you know, so these are the pain, these are the, the sins that are visited on, you know, because we have, we have sin. Uh, so, uh, so this is, you know, drugs, um, uh, yeah, you can see it's all bad. And so it finishes with the video, which is the risk of, um, you know, the terrible things that can happen. And of course, all along, all the way along, I did have a, have a really interesting moment where I thought, that girl looks like a lesbian. And then I realised it was uh, actually a boy, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, but they, you know, as they're going through, as, as you go through, you know, there's this whole, it's dangerous to think about diversity. Diversity is dangerous. I mean, what was fascinating to me was that in spite of the fact that it's a kind of a historical walk through the Bible, there's almost no people of colour in there at all. You know, there's definitely no black people. <laughs> and, uh, it was uh, fascinating. What was really fascinating was how many black people were visitors. and <laughs> Really kind of sad. So, uh, so this is a very well visited uh, museum. So with a whole lot of graffiti is dangerous because inner city is dangerous. Make of that what you will. And of course, there's also another calibration here that's, that's interesting. And that's that this guy here is a, an, uh, these are two archeologists. And uh, sorry, I should say this is, if you can't tell because the photo's not that good, it's a, um, it's a diorama, so they're not real people. Um, so however, there are videos of each of them talking about um, uh, about the uh, about how they came to work together, because one of them's an archaeologist that believes in evolution, and the other one's one who's become enlightened and has worked out what happened, and he's worked out why. Because dinosaurs are really heavy, so they sank lower. And uh, anyway, it, it, my knowledge of science is poor, but it's not that poor. But you know, it, but they've got. He's got an answer for it. He's got an answer for it, and he's worked it through, and it's his truth. Um, you know, no matter how much I'm picking on it, and. You know, so this is this guy who is a white, I, I would guess, straight guy. Um, this is an Asian gay guy. Um, and he is cast as the devil in this space. So he's eth ethnically Chinese, uh, he's uh, American, uh, and they're both, uh, they're both American, they both work together. Uh, you know, the, uh, this guy uh, spends most of the time talking about how silly the other guy is and the other guy's just saying, just doesn't understand. So it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, and again, it's one of those moments where you sort of realise um, that the world that's being presented is really different to the world that's presented in other contexts of museums, you know? It is a different world, it wasn't my world. So this is me looking terribly embarrassed <laughs> Um, sorry, there's a reason why I've got this. This is like a quasi-selfie, I realise. But I'm next to um, a... Th they sometimes use them, uh, the, um, 
megafauna as an example, you know, it, it becomes that kind of uh, problem area where, oh, if megafauna exists, then surely you could have dinosaurs at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a me megafauna object uh, uh, item. And I'm getting my picture taken by uh, the manager of the Creation Museum who uh, I'd already been through the museum and I had a, have a responsibility when I go to a museum, I have to tell them what I'm doing. Um, I have to announce myself uh, and say what I'm doing and why I'm there. And so I'd done that at the beginning of it. I'd gone through. I was kind of a nervous wreck by the end of it. It was weird. Um, you know, it was a weird feeling for me. Not, not because the space was weird, but because I was having all of these emotional responses to it and so on. And I may have said it was the best museum I've ever been to in my life. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, and somebody said, can I... Can I say that somebody who's got a PhD in this and who's doing a major ARC project has said that, you know, they sent me an email of that and I still haven't responded to it. <laughs> it's, I, I'm terribly embarrassed by it, but I know that I felt like my gender and sexuality was on show in a way that I don't always feel. People, you know, can say this about, you know, the southern states in the US. They can say it about what they see as unsafe spaces, but we all know that it, it can be confused and it can be confused by oneself in the way that you think about yourself as well. And so I wasn't, you know, but what was happening here was it was compounded by the fact that I was being told constantly what normal was and I wasn't it. And so I kept, you know, so I'm there thinking, do I look like a lesbian? You know, I'm, I'm having those thoughts that I imagine a whole lot of people would feel, you know, who saw themselves being judged because the whole space operated as that space of judgment because... You know, when you're not allowed to recalibrate, actually that's pretty much what happens. You know, it's not just about invisibility. It's also about, you know, the risk of visibility um, within that space. And I'd say as a middle-aged uh, woman in, in a space like that, white-looking, I don't think it happens to me in other ways. So <clears throat> I'm just going to finish this off. And, and I realise that I've only touched on gender and sexuality. That's kind of the point. Um, and I hope that I continue to just touch on this. I think in the same way as it's important for Indigenous academics to continue to work in mainstream contexts and to continue to do work that is not only about, uh, about us, I think it's also incredibly important that, um, that we start to think about gender and sexuality and our genders and sexuality as something that can be recast beyond just something that becomes narrowly defined in that way. So just to finish off, I, I went to a place called Salmora Stag, which is in the, um, which is the University of the Highland and Islands, uh, Highlands and Islands, uh, in Scotland's uh, Gaelic College, and I spent some time there. Um, and this is their website. I wanted to show their website, but I'll pop back to it in a sec. Uh, forward. Uh, this is where it's located, Salmora Stag. It's on the Isle of Skye. Um, and they have something called Tabarrel de Case, um, Kiss of Riches. Uh, Kiss of Riches is in Scots, so it's Chest of Riches. And uh, Tabarrel de Case is the same. So it's like a, it's a database. It's a database of these wonderful songs and stories and so on that have been gathered either in Scots language or in Gaelic, uh, and in some cases in English as well. And uh, you can go onto the website, it's open to anyone, and you can uh, download some of these. Some of them are recorded in the teen years in the 1920s, 1930s, really amazing. And there was this fear, of course, at the time, we, you know, we know it, that uh, people were worried that languages were going to disappear, uh, you know, and this was a way for them to be retained in some way. And we, we kind of know the difficulty of that language. Um, but they continue to see this as a really important project for them. And uh, it's a wonderful project and really interesting. So um, this is a particular... Uh, entry that I just wanted to, um, to bring up here because it's part of the conversation that I'd had with the, uh, with the, the women who run, the three women who, who run the, um, the uh, repository and they talked about the fact that a lot of the entries that were made weren't accurate. And so if you look to the bottom and it said Margaret Fayshaw stayed with her and her sister, Mary Andra, um, uh, well, the breakdown of it is 